when they try to get into TV and try to get into film, is they think that their art and what they do is a be all and end all of everything. Welcome, you're listening to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 504, with today's guest, Kwang Jae Nim, CM Griffin. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, your host on the show, founder of Whistlekick, and everything we do here at Whistlekick is in support of the traditional martial arts. If you want to see what we do, check out whistlekick.com. That's our digital hub. It's the place to find our store. And if you make a purchase of one of those great things in the store, use the code PODCAST15. That'll get you 15% off. and helps justify all of the time and the money that we put into this show. Now, Martial Arts Radio gets its own website, and that's whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. The show comes out twice a week, and the goal of this show is to connect, educate, and entertain the traditional martial artists throughout the world. If you want to help the show and the work that we do, you can do quite a few things. You can make a purchase. You could share an episode, follow us on social media, maybe tell a friend, pick up a book on Amazon, leave us a review somewhere, or support our Patreon. If you think the new shows that we release are worth 63 cents a piece, not to mention all the back episodes that you get continued access to, consider supporting us at $5 a month. Visit patreon.com slash whistlekick and sign up there. If you do, we're going to give you even more content. Yeah, we just keep the content coming. Today's guest, like many of our guests, is a referral from a past guest. Someone that we had such a great time talking to, we said, who else should we talk to? And that person said, this person. And so that's how we get to Kwang Jin Griffin. Had a wonderful conversation, a funny conversation. Man, this guy made me laugh. We talked about everything from starting over to connections within the arts, the benefits of the arts, just a ton of great stuff. And I'm sure you're going to love it. So here we go with our conversation. Kwan Jing Nim Griffin, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you, sir. Hey, thanks for coming on. Thanks for your time. And we were just chatting a little bit before, you know, quite often when I bring a guest on, they don't have a tech background. They don't, they don't have to worry about this stuff. But you and what you've got going on is much more involved than what we do. I mean, I've got like two cords here and you've got <laughs> cameras and plugs and, and I'm going to guess there's a video snake somewhere in there and, and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, um, right now I'm in what we call master control because I am the uh, studio supervisor here. And uh, so I'm in master control where we check like six different channels and make sure everything goes on at the time that's supposed to go on, the way it's supposed to go on. And oh, cool. also have to produce a number of shows and, and on and on and on and on. <laughs> How'd you get into that? That's There aren't a whole lot of people that I talk to these days that are in TV in the way that you or, or video or however you want to term it, the way you're in it? Well, actually, I went to school. I graduated from Syracuse University, Newhouse, VPA, back in 1980. And just to let you know how old I am. And uh, I majored in cinema drama, which is, you know, filmmaking. And then uh, just through trial and error and doing different things and movies and TV, I somehow, you know, with a, a wife and next wife whatever ended up here and sent to damn natty and uh ended up at the tv station you know producing shows directing shows and uh then they needed somebody to oversee the entire studio and i was available so i said you know what money's right i get access to all this equipment so i can do my own projects and you know get to where i want to get to and boom there you go Mm, cool. And as I'm sure the listeners have already guessed, because I would guess if I was them, there's probably some overlap in some of those projects with martial arts, isn't there? Oh, yeah. Now there is. <laughs> when Back when I was first starting out, a lot of people didn't know that I did martial arts because martial arts was just something that I, I did. You know, it wasn't a hobby. It was what I did. And to work, I worked on movies and TV. I mean, I worked on The White Shadow. I worked on um, Hill Street Blues, a couple other shows. I did shows, MTV, and did some music videos and what have you. And um, that was completely, you know, separate to teaching and training in the martial arts. And then around, mm, I'd say, the early 90s, uh, 
still living in New York, still living back home, everybody went on strike. The producers went on strike. The actors went on strike like they always do. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that, but <laughs> screw them. The actors went on strike <laughs> and, uh, and the directors went on strike. So there was no work in television for me. There's no work in TV and film. New York, at that point, New York City, the hotels and what have you were at like 30% occupancy. There was just there was just no work. People were leaving, going to certain right to work states like Georgia and South and North Carolina. And I couldn't. And sitting there trying to figure out, you know, what the hell am I gonna do? I'm not making money teaching martial arts, working with my teacher. And my wife smacked me upside the head and said, why don't you combine your martial arts with your directing skills? Of course, after I got up and dusted myself off from her smack, and I was like, she's right. Though I'll never admit that to her ever. But uh, yes, yeah, she was right. So I just started doing, um, actually combining them, going around doing, uh, I did some uh, videos for, uh, the uh, World Taekwondo Federation. I did videos for various people. And then I started doing some of my own shows. Like um, I got a couple of shows on um, that are airing here in the Midwest from the Dojang. And well, actually I started doing those when I came out here. So those don't count really. But yeah, I just, it, it just, that period of time, it just so happened that there was nothing else to do, no work. So we created work. Now, everybody I've ever talked to who has had some kind of content related to martial arts, whether it's, you know, fellow podcasters I've spoken with or authors or video, whether that's TV or movies or documentary, there tends to be this kind of discovery process. You, you go into it with your understanding of, of your art or your arts and, and the things you've trained. And the moment that you start creating that content for other people, something seems to happen. And I don't know that if I, yeah. that I can put yeah. words to it, but because you've done it, I think you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah, it, it happened a couple of times for me. It's weird because you had a previous guest on, TJ Glenn, and TJ and I did a number of movies, you know, low-budget movies and certain movies that you wouldn't, say, mention in, you know, around your wife, you'd say them around your friends, you know, your male friend, but you would never admit that you watched them. <laughs> <laughs> but we did a number of movies doing stunts, uh, choreographed a number of uh, martial art fights, did stuff with my teacher. Um, and just doing that opened up a certain, I don't want to say it was a door, but it just opened up certain things that I didn't take into account. And then the first tape that I did on my own, uh, I did it for a gentleman who just passed away well, the Kuroshi Do system it was a jujitsu system named uh, Papa San Kanti. And uh, Papa San is also the man that introduced me, reintroduced me to Moses Powell. But um, doing his tape, it's like, wow, I, this doesn't work. This will work. This doesn't work. How come they do this? How can I change that for the camera? How can I do that? You know, wait a minute. My art does this, but they do, you know, that whole combination and for lack of a better word confluence of everything smacking together and fighting for control of your attention it happened a few times yeah there's there's an interesting depth that seems to come out when you when you have to because when you have to present your arts in as content right you have to think about what it's like to experience that as someone who hasn't trained or hasn't trained in the way you have and it forces your mind into this alternate perspective that I don't think most people ever really experience. No, if you haven't done it, it yeah, you're you're absolutely right because you're looking at let's 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 even put it to the fact that if you're uh, let's just say you're a uh, you're a former football player and you played pro for a couple of years. Now, if you've played in the NFL, that meant that you probably played in high school. You definitely played in college, so you played pro. Well, now you're no longer playing. You're going back, and you're, now you're going to try to coach. It's a completely different mindset, and you see things that you may not have been aware of because you're too busy playing or too busy doing. And then you notice what other people are doing. 
it's I equate it to something similar to that. Yeah. You yeah, know, it's a good you just don't see those things when you're doing it. You know, you may, you may be more myopic, for lack of a better term. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Now, you this know, martial. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Go uh, ahead. No, no, this is your episode. This is your show. <laughs> I'm my job here is just to to facilitate your stories and in your conversation. Well, but, one of the things I did want to add then was please. that I just did a piece called. Um, so you want to get into television from tournaments to TV. And I talked to TJ and a couple of other my buddies. And one of the things that we all agreed, because we all had some degree of martial arts training. One of the problems that happens with a lot of uh, martial artists when they try to get into TV and try to get into film is they think that their art and what they do is a be all and end all of everything. And they quickly find out that it's not. You could be the biggest, baddest, toughest guy to ever walked on the dojang. They're going to erect statues of you. Bruce Lee is going to bow down. Jackie Chan is going to give way because that's how magnificent you are. The wonderfulness of your technique is great, but it just doesn't work on TV. You got to learn a completely different way. You got to learn a completely different thing, which means you do have to open up your mind to what someone else is doing. And that's part of the beauty and also the aggravation of working in this industry. It's like, mm, I got to be able to be open to see what everybody else is doing. It's mm, a great point. It's a great comparison. I, I've not been on film. I've not explored that side of martial arts, but we've had quite a few guests who have, and they talk about that similarly, this idea that what you do, how you feel, it doesn't always work on camera. And in fact, some of them have gone so far as to say it usually doesn't work on camera. No, real martial arts. I, again, not trying to promote anything, but I did a piece also called, you know, why you'll never, ever see real martial arts in television and film unless it's a documentary. For a number of reasons, one of the simplest reasons is if you're a fighter, you're trained and taught to hide or disguise your techniques. Well, if you disguise and hide your techniques and the audience can't see it, so the audience doesn't know what you're doing, so the audience isn't going to watch anymore. Makes for some boring television. Right, right. Real fighters, I hate working with real fighters. Uh, I've said that years ago. I, I do not like working with real fighters. I'd rather take uh, a dancer, a gymnast, train them for a couple of weeks, let them see how to do certain things, and boom. They'll look like they're as good as Bruce Lee. Hey, look at Jean-Claude Van Damme, you know? It's a great point. Absolutely. And this is why I think a lot of us as martial artists, we see someone who, you know, has six or eight weeks of martial arts training and they're starring in this film and they they look pretty good. But I don't know. I can't speak for everyone, but I get jealous. Yeah. You know, I've got I've got all this training and and. I want to do that. I want to be the guy out in front making the millions of dollars on right. screen. Right. It, it, it's possible, but you have to alter what you do. You, you have to simply alter what you do. The fact that you know how to throw that beautiful sidekick. Oh, yeah. You can get your body in a six o'clock position and lock it there. Oh, that's wonderful. Now, can you do it in a way that makes the audience think, that you got power and you knock this other guy out and the other guy that you're fighting against me, the toughest thing he may have had to fight was sleep. So he doesn't know anything about, you know, to him, a dojo is that place that he goes downtown to get some sushi. He doesn't know anything about anything. Mm -hmm. So you're going to try to do your techniques to him. Somebody's going to get hurt. And trust me, producers do not like it especially when their stars get hurt because that closes down the set, but you still got to pay us anyway. (laughs) Mm. So they lose money. So yeah, you gotta, you gotta alter what you do. You got to change what you do for the camera. Uh, I tell a lot of real fighters and real martial artists, think of it as if you're learning a new martial art. Right on. Now you mentioned that when you got into TV and film, at the time, martial arts was something you did, that the two were separate at the time. So right. how did you first get started with martial arts? Wow. Okay. I am part of that generation 
that was watching TV on a Friday night and sitting down in front of a little black and white television and this little guy in a black uniform standing next to a taller guy and this, this I guess it was a green coat. Uh, but this little guy in this black chauffeur's uniform was beating the schnuggies out of everybody on screen in a way that we hadn't seen before. Now, yeah, Fred Flintstone had his judo chop. And Captain Kirk did some kind of Lord knows what he did, but he did it, you know. But no, we, we, we'd we never seen that before. And then I found out this guy's name was Bruce Lee. And he was doing this thing called Kung Fu. The other people were calling it uh, karate. So at like eight or 10 years old, tried to get, you know, find a place, you know, how you bug your mom to do that. But they weren't a lot of schools around, you know, back then. So I had an uncle that had just gotten out the military and I guess to shut me <laughs> up and to stop me, you know, my mother from knocking my head into something and my father from kicking my ass. Yeah. He, uh, he decided he started training me a little bit and he trained me in, for lack of a better word, let's just call it military jujitsu. And I did that for a while. And then he introduced me to, uh, he actually, he took me to uh, Tiger Kim's uh, Taekwondo school on Fordham Road. And uh, that's pretty much where it started. Though so Tiger Kim was not a good experience. Hmm. My father was not for it. I got a funny story about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. After I left Tiger Kim's, uh, after I was kicked out of Tiger Kim's, um, <laughs> I was looking for, you know, another place to train. And there was a school that opened up a couple of miles away from the house. It was right on the, you know, to me it was easy because all I had to do was take the train two stops and boom, I was there. And um, so, you know, I went in, looked at everything and, you know, the the, the sensei told me, you know, I got to come back with my dad. My mom signed me up. Okay. My father, God rest his beautiful soul, was a World War II veteran. You know, part of, born during the Depression. So he didn't like all this stuff. You know, he called uh, martial arts fancy street fighting. You know, he wasn't for it at all. But somehow, I guess, between my uncle and my grandmother said, you know, take that boy down to that school. So my father came in from work and um, with his, still had his suit on. We went down to uh, the guy at Dojang and it wasn't good. <laughs> it was not good at all because this guy was one of those, in retrospect, one of those, you know, I am the be all and end all of martial arts. You know the type I'm I'm talking about. Yeah. yeah. And he had a class. This is like 1971, maybe? 70, 71? This is before Bruce Lee. Um, I mean, before the uh, before Into the Dragon and Fist of Fury and that stuff. Yeah. And um, so he had a small class, you know, maybe like seven, six, seven other people in it. So we're over in the corner and he's convincing my, you know, my father that, you know, they should sign me up for the classes. My father's, you know, not believing him. And he tells my dad that, you know, he's one of the best because, you know, he, uh, he he's a fourth degree black belt. And my father's like, what the hell does that mean? And, you know, he said, I turned to dad because, you know, I know martial arts. I've been reading the magazines, you know, Black Belt and all that other kind of stuff. And so I know martial arts and the training with my uncle. So I tell him, Dad, you know, that means he's got four Black Belts. It's as long as he's been training. That's how good he is. He's got four Black Belts. My father said, that doesn't mean a damn thing. So the guy said, Mr. Brown, what I can do here is I bet you I can kick you in your face before you can lay a finger on me. That was the dumbest thing to ever say to my dad. <laughs> so my dad said, really? 
took off his jacket, rolled up his sleeves, tucked his tie into his shirt, and said, okay. And I'm getting embarrassed. I'm looking around. Everybody's looking at me, and I'm thinking, oh, my God, my dad's going to get beaten up by this guy, and I got to explain it to my mom. Mom's going to beat me because I let dad get beat up, you know. And so they step out on the floor, and my father, you know, my father was nice. He took off his shoes, didn't take off his socks. Thank God he didn't take off his socks. My father had horrible feet. But anyway, um, he's standing there, and the guy takes a traditional karate stance. My father just got in a regular old 1940-style boxing stance. The guy went to throw a kick. My dad threw a left and a right. Dude was on the ground. <laughs> All his students run up. And it's like going like, oh, oh, what happened? He's on the ground. And I'm embarrassed. I'm like, oh, damn, dad just punched out the teacher. And then um, my dad, in his unique style, takes a jacket, fixes his tie and everything. Walks over to the guy and says, and I swear to God, my dad says, you got four black belts. I got two black fists. Let's go, son. And I'm thinking, oh, damn, I guess I'm never going to come to this school. Not realizing that, what the hell would I want to come here for? My dad just knocked the guy out. <laughs> but that was like back in, like I said, that was like 70, 71 or something like that. But I eventually, you know, went on and went back to other schools. And then when I was in college, I got into, uh, I got a coupon. You know, when you go to a college freshman year, sometimes they give you these coupon books for like local businesses. Yeah. yeah. They gave me one and, um, you know, pizza and, you know, beer and all this other kind of stuff. And it was one for like, it's like $5 a month to join this, Korean martial art class called Harang Do. Five dollars a month sounds good to me. I can afford that. You know, I'm a typical poor college student. I ain't got no money. Went down there, signed up, master there, master YS Kim. It was very different from the time that I walked in because Master Kim did not act like one of those, you know, I am Lord of all I survey. He wasn't like that at all. He was like a you know. Uh, 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 wasn't even one of those, you know, coaches because I had some football coaches that were just, you know, worse than General Patton. But he was, he was concerned. We talked about school, talked about my major. How was I going to get to class and then come down and train if that wasn't going to be too much to do? You know, blah blah blah. We talked for a while, and then I said, you know what? I gotta, I gotta, I, I gotta come here. And I started training there. And back then, the training was very different than it is today. And um, I've been in Huarong Do since then, since 1976. I haven't left. Wow. Yeah. Master Kim, he uh, went back to Korea. And well, after I graduated in 80, I went out to Los Angeles. And that actually, I went out to LA to work on um, The White Shadow. And that's when I met uh, Dr. Ju Bong Lee. And I trained out there for a couple of years and then uh, came back to New York. And there was nobody in New York for me to really train with in Huarong Do. So I would go down to train with uh, Master Kim in D.C. like once a month. Actually, it ended up being once every other month because that, that train ride to D.C. got kind of expensive. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, we got together and we got... Uh, uh, Master uh, uh, Master Yum, my current teacher, my father. He um, he came and we did a whole thing. And this was eighty six, yeah, eighty six. He came to New York and we I helped him start uh, Huarong No classes on the East Coast. But I had a problem in that um, because of all the football I played, this would stop me from playing football in college. I had to rip my groin muscle like three times. And, you know, being a young idiot, I never let it heal properly. So after, you know, gave up my scholarship because they weren't going to pay for it. Um, uh, 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 
I found that there were certain things I just couldn't do and I wasn't training properly, if that makes sense. And um, uh, Master Yam, now Kuksun and Grandmaster Yam, said, you know, I know you love Huarangdo, but if you want to stay in Huarangdo, you got a choice. You can drop back down to white belt and start all over again because you got a lot of bad habits because of your leg. Or you can keep your current rank and just don't do anything with us. I went back to white belt after already being a black belt. So I, wow. essentially I started over again. Now, we've had plenty of people on the show who have cross-trained. They step out and do another style. and mm -hmm. you know, They happily put on a white belt and learn new things. But I don't know that we've had anyone who went back to white belt in the same style. You, you, you say it like it was an easy decision, but was it? No. Okay. Uh, it took me about a month, maybe a little longer. Because, well, what, one of the things that looking back on it, you know, looking back on things, nostalgia, what have you, is a wonderful, wonderful tool, but it's a lie. <laughs> it was my ego more than anything else. I, I, why was I going to go back? I was a black belt. Why am I going to already go back to white belt? But if you really love what you're doing and you're not doing it properly, why not? There's, there's no reason why not. A belt can't fight for you. A belt is just a symbol of, you know, the, your, your knowledge at that particular point or your supposed knowledge at that particular point. And if your supposed knowledge isn't accurate or correct, it's worthless. You want to go to somebody, you want to go to a doctor that has a, uh, all these degrees on his wall, and now he's going to perform surgery on you, but he hasn't, he's not up on the latest techniques. And in fact, he holds his scalpel the wrong way. Hell no. Go back. Knowledge, knowledge, skill, and experience, as I tell all my students, knowledge, skill, and experience are three things that are truly yours. In this universe, you may not have anything else, but you have those three. And nothing and no one can take those away from you. So it doesn't matter if I went back to white belt, I still had all the experience I had previously. And for some people that tried to test me because they thought I was a white belt, they learned the, they, they, they learned the Bronx way. No, <laughs> don't step to me, don't be stupid. Uh, get off my soapbox now. <laughs> no, no, stand, stand tall. But yeah, that's yeah. So no, it wasn't an easy decision. But when I made it, I would not even even looking back on it. I think I did make the right decision. Did you have moments where you second guessed it? Oh hell yeah! Oh hell can yeah! You can you talk about that? I, I'm a white belt in class with a bunch of other people that never took an art before in their life. And I was already a black belt and I had to slow myself down. And then I end up helping them. And I'm like, I shouldn't be doing this. I should be a black belt. And then when I was a green belt, we went to a tournament. We didn't usually go to tournaments. Swarango really was in a tournament system. We started going to tournaments because of in your in this society, you don't go to tournaments, you don't have any students. Nobody knows who the hell you are, really. You can have a nice private school, but you want to get students, you're a happy ass better go out and promote yourself somehow. And the best place to do that is tournaments. So Cooks and him relented and I'd already been to a few tournaments. I knew a bunch of people. And here I am suddenly showing up. <laughs> I'm showing up to this tournament in Brooklyn, <laughs> seeing a bunch of people that I knew or hung out with. So a young lady I used to date, <laughs> and I'm wearing a green belt, and they knew me as a black belt. <laughs> that didn't go over too well. <laughs> Did they think yeah, that, you were that didn't, trying that didn't to game the right. system? Say what? They think you were trying to game it, you know, kind of cheat, coming in as a green belt? Mm, yes and no. Because I didn't, I didn't enter anything. Uh, um, the other guys were competing, and um, I just, I didn't feel right. 
And so, especially when, uh, I'm not going to say her name, but she came up with her current boyfriend, a jackass, but um, she came up to me with that current boyfriend and like, oh, I thought you was a black belt. What happened? Blah, blah, blah. Yakety. You know how women can do. So, um, yeah, that didn't feel good. That didn't feel good. And then um, uh, uh, Rico Guy and a couple of other masters, they were looking at me like, Wait a minute. <laughs> but I told them, I, no, I'm not competing. I'm here supporting these other guys. I'm I'm not competing. And then uh, a couple of years later, when I entered and got my black belt back, and then I entered into tournaments, they were like, oh, okay. Okay. Um, Rina Morales, Shihan, actually uh, gave me an excellent recommendation uh, to a couple of people. And even Professor Powell, uh, and I'm not jujitsu. I'm, you know, I've been a Korean stylist almost all my life, and he uh, he gave me a glowing recommendation because he said, you know, because of what I did, I didn't compete. I didn't. I waited till I got black belt again. Took a couple of years, but I think it was worth it. Got some insight on certain techniques. I wonder, and this isn't a fully fleshed out thought, but you seem like the perfect person to bounce it off. I wonder if there's benefit in that. You know, we're we're constantly told our basics are important, and you know, we're we're always refining. But you know, we see, uh, you know, a lot of these martial artists that we look up to, you know, really reiterating the importance of basics. Do you think there mm-hmm. might be value in maybe not formally setting down your rank, your your black belt, however many stripes may be on it, in favor of a white belt, but pretending, you know, spending. 30 or 60 days as a lower rank and re-experiencing that stuff? I could see some. It's a hard ego thing to do. But I know, like, out here in Cincinnati, well, first of all, there's two things. Number one, my uh, uh, uh Grandmaster uh, Yom Kinam, whenever we had a black belt classes, you know, and our black belt classes were like two and a half, three hours long, uh, it was really white belt. We spent over, we, we spent a lot of time on white belt. And I agree with him that, you know, the difference, really the difference between a beginner and a black belt is the black belt understands those techniques that you do in the beginning and they look sharper. Because if your, 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 your white belt techniques don't look good, the hell are you trying to do these advanced techniques? or so-called advanced techniques. It's like you're trying to build a skyscraper, but your foundation is weak. The skyscraper is going to fall. Well, out here, a a very good friend and mentor of mine, his name is uh, Woodrow Fairbanks, Grandmaster Woodrow Fairbanks. He was a student of uh, Victor Moore. Victor Moore is a controversial man that fought Bruce Lee. Yeah, he's been on the show. Oh, Victor Moore? Yeah. Yeah, Okay, well, yeah. Um, then Episode he's probably 20, if anybody's listening. Okay. Yeah, well, um, I trained with Victor Moore out here. And um, like I said, his, his student, Woodrow Fairbanks, is, um, I call him my mentor out here. He, uh, Whenever we get together and whenever they have a black belt class, you take off your belt. You, you take off your belt. And you work. You work on whatever basics and fundamentals that was selected for that day. It's not about, I mean, there's but so many ways that you can throw, when you actually analyze it, there's but so many ways you're going to throw a kick and a punch. Now, it's about how your body reacts to it. But if if you don't have proper fundamentals, your basics are not there, then forget about it. How do you respond to people who it tends to happen around you know that brown red belt that that phase where you know they're not black belts yet but they've mm, in their eyes burn out yeah yeah you know they uh they've mastered all that that non black belt material and they're really good at it and they're ready for more and you know those of us who've been around a while see see the gaps and they see you know where things could certainly be be better how do you address that 
how do you have that conversation to say, hey, you know, I put down my white belt to start over. You, you have no, you're in no position to say that you're king, whatever. I honestly, I'm a rotten person to ask that because I take it on a subjective, subjective level, depends on the person. Mm-hmm. Like when my students got to that particular point, <laughs> one really tall guy that I can think of who had on your show, he was really bad at it. And um, different things, you do different things to different people. Him, I had to show her where you think you know, but you don't. You can't do X, Y, and Z. Sometimes it's good to let the student put their hand in the fire and get burned. Professor Powell used to say, pain is a wonderful teacher because you will not forget the pain and you'll always remember the lesson that pain taught you. So letting them see, I guess, like I said, I did subjectively because everybody's different. You know, you don't, you're not there yet. You think you are, but you're not. Sometimes it could be something as simple as, yeah, well, then do this. And they don't know what you did or, or they can't do it. Other times it could be like, oh, yeah, see, I thought you were ready for this. How come I smacked you upside your head? Mm-hmm. It just depends. Yeah. And like I said, I take it, I take it subjectively because I, I know what that feels like. I remember the first time I went through it, it was like, wait a minute, why, why, why am I still here? Well, back then we only had six, five belts. Why am I here at this damn red belt? And that guy is a black belt. And I know I look better than him. I can do more push-ups. My kicks are sharper. Why? Well, my attitude wasn't there. Well, you know, whatever. It's subjective. You know, so that with students. I, and I would not tell any other teacher what to tell their students because they should know. That's, you know, again, I'm going to jump on my soapbox. That's why I'm against these mega schools. You know, it's like, how the hell are you going to be able to teach somebody? You don't know this person. If you've got 300 people in your school, yeah, you know that person named uh, uh, Frankie Jones? I don't think you do. So you have no idea who he is and what he's going through. So how are you going to help him make martial arts a part of him? Because it's more than just kicking and punching. It's more than that. And if you can't, you know, combine those two for that person, just go ahead and be a sports teacher. I'd say you're teaching martial arts. Just teach sports. It's an important distinction. Yeah. Why I hate what, think what the cooking one is doing now is, is, is bad. It's, I think they're heading the same road that China did, where they got rid of Kung Fu. And called it wushu, and had this whole thing, you know, okay, whatever. Now, you know, let's do the hamadang. Hamadang is great. Let's get rid of sparring. Well, wait, why? First of all, you're just doing, kicking each other. You know, you do have these things on your shoulders called hands. You should block every now and then, but hey. I want to shift gears for a minute. You brought mm-hmm. up Grandmaster Powell a couple times. Mm-hmm. And, you know, his his name's come up before, but I don't know that we've had anyone who trained with him on the show. And I wonder if you might take a couple minutes and talk about him and your experiences. Wow. Professor Moses Powell was an enigmatic legend. He was one of the first black men that when you talk about martial artists, you had to, you, you had to look to him. He was the one that everybody's looked at. Um, uh, words can't, couldn't do him justice. You had to see him, you know, picture somebody just maybe like Mike Tyson. Okay. Picture that kind of body, maybe mm-hmm. a little bit bigger, but picture moving so fast, being able to do one finger rolls and he could be like three, it'd be five feet in front of you. and. When you blink, next thing you know, he's got you in a joint lock. (laughs) 
and you like how did how did that happen? Smooth, enigmatic, charismatic. He he, Professor Powell was a unique individual, and again, unique to the '60s. Um, and I think he uh, uh, there's so many rumors about him, and I don't want to spread falsehoods. He passed away about 2000. 2005, if I remember, yeah. if I'm getting my dates right. Yeah, right around then, because um, I think him and William Oliver, somebody else passed away at about that same period. You know how they say they, they passed away in threes? Mm, yeah. Um, but um, I went to him, like I, I interviewed him a couple of times when I was writing for Black Belt, or did a couple of articles for Black Belt magazine and um, Inside Karate, Inside yeah, for a couple of the magazines, I did some articles on him, and um, I got the opportunity to train with him. And one of the beauties of beautiful things about my teacher, right, Cookson and Yum, is that he has no ego. So he wasn't the type of man that say, "Oh, you train only with me. That's it. No one else." Never said that. Never did that. He would often say, you know. You have questions, sometimes go out and look at, you know, other martial arts step, maybe answer your questions. Okay. And I had a question about, you know, some of the joint lock applications that we have in Harang Do. You know, somebody my size, what I did, it just it just didn't feel right. Kuksanim was a lot s- smaller than me. So I couldn't get my body to do what he was doing. Plus, I also had the problem with my leg. So I went to Professor Powell through mutual friends and uh, started training with him for a couple of years. Opened my eyes and everything that I did, I brought back into Harang Do. And uh, <laughs> remember I, I was teaching a class at, uh, it wasn't Hillside, it was at, um, it was in Union, teaching a class in Union and Cooksman came up Smack me in the back of the head. Why did everybody like smacking me in the back of the head? I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> I, I have the same affliction. I don't, I don't know where it is, but we, we share it. I don't know. Maybe that's why I wear glasses. Everybody smacking me in the back of the head. But uh, but uh, he smacked me and he said, oh, good. That's very good. Now, instead of doing it like this, I'm just, he just made a slight adjustment to what I picked up for Moses Powell. Um, but Professor Powell, he was just, if you can picture walking down, this, walking into some place with um, Miles Davis. Miles Davis is at his prime, and, you, you know, you're going to go get lunch, and everybody knows who's My- who Miles Davis is. Professor Moses Powell, I say, was an absolute genius in the martial arts. He's a Mozart. He... I never saw him repeat himself, but he just, an incredible man to train with. And I will say one floor, if you were a beginner, and again, I'm training with Professor Powell in the mid nineties. And my opinion was if you were a beginner, you really couldn't pick up what he was saying. You couldn't, you couldn't grasp his, his principles. So some, a lot of beginners or people that when that didn't have the, the um style or the softer style understanding about joint locks and flow and such like that, um, if you were a bang, bang, hard linear, you, you would have a hard time picking up his techniques. But if you did understand it, it would open your eyes. And you'd walk away going, damn. <laughs> yeah, wow. Professor Powell is a unique individual. Yeah. A unique individual. There, there are a handful of people that I'm sad that I'll never get to interview, and he's he's definitely on yeah. the list. Yeah, Professor Powell, he was a fun interview, too. He was a fun interview. He uh giving, he's open, you know. And if you're a martial artist, God help you, because he, if you ask him about a technique, he would demonstrate it all. <laughs> <laughs> And you're standing there going, thank you, sir. Now, can somebody please hand me a new hand? Because I can't. 
<laughs> I'm, I'm laughing half because of the story, half because I've experienced this. And yeah. it gets to a point where you say, hey, um, you over here, lower rank. Um, do you understand that movement? No, not really. Oh, you should ask him. <laughs> ask him about yeah. it. So, so <laughs> I learned to work the system so I could get the information without, you know, the, 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 the joint strain. Yeah. Yeah, but interviewing him, oh God, the the oh man, <laughs> I uh, in the nineties I joined the uh, the Dragon Society also, mm -hmm. and um, started to I didn't I was one of those guys that didn't believe in pressure points, I didn't believe in pressure point science, to me it was some kind of ghost crap, some mythology that people made up to you know enhance their own legend. And then um, Hooks and him started showing us things and saying, this is pressure point. In fact, I even I started taking acupuncture. I was going to, if 9-11 didn't happen, I was signed up to, uh, to get a degree in acupuncture uh, from a school out there on uh, 28th Street. Um, but anyway, so I started uh, having acupuncture done. And so I started understanding a little more. But acupuncture, you know, to me, pressure points? No. These are needles. These are things piercing your skin. You're pushing it. And what happens if you wear a coat? That's not going to make sense. Well, uh, my younger brother, Chris Fox, who himself is an incredible martial artist. Uh, Chris trained with Professor Powell. For that, he trained with me. And then he also trained uh, in Kyokushinkai. And then he trained, and now he's trained in Okinawa. Uh, uh, traditional Okinawa goju, but um, Chris was no joke. Chris, Chris, Chris was no joke because he was thinking about combining, you know, the Kyokushin, a hardcore, full contact with Professor Powell's theories, mm. and uh, it was yeah, Chris was no joke. And so we went. He paid for it, otherwise I wasn't going to go. <laughs> We went to a Dragon Society seminar and I met Professor Muncie. And they were talking about, you know, pressure points and, you know, this is gallbladder 33 and this is liver nine and you do this and you do that. And I'm standing there going, yeah, 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 whatever. And then he went to do a technique and he asked Chris. Now he already knew Chris. So Chris threw the punch and it looked like. Professor Muncy, like, barely touched him in three spots, and Chris went down on the floor. Now, like I said, I know Chris. Chris and I were brothers for a bunch of years. And Chris is no joke. Kyoko Shinkai, Professor Powell, Okinawan Goju, I mean, hardcore Okinawan San traditional sanchi in Okinawa and Goju. You know what I'm saying? I do, I do. All right, and this big black dude is now crumbled up in a heap on the floor? Nah. Well, I kind of did the dumb, you don't do this at seminar, you should know better thing. <laughs> yeah, that idiot with me. Because next thing I know, I hear my dumb ass say, excuse me, can you do that on me? <laughs> How'd that go over? Well, thank God. In Harlem Do, we do a lot of chi energy and chi power training, which helped. So he didn't knock me out because my energy was up. But I could feel weak. Like if he wanted to smack me around and reach in and grab my wallet, I would have had a very, I wouldn't have been able to really defend it. I, I wouldn't have been able to defend it. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what, what is this? And then when he started talking, then we went off to the side while some of the other students were talking, him and I were talking. He said, this is a pressure point. This is this, this is that. And I'm like, this is some of the same stuff that my teacher was telling me. But I wasn't paying any attention to it. Because you didn't think it worked. No. And then I realized what it is and how it works. It's not what people think. It's not like, 
I'm going to magically touch you and you're going to, your body is going to explode. No, it's not like, what was that? What, what, what is that uh, anime, A Fist of the North Star, where I'm going to touch you in a couple of places and, you know, your butt's going to explode and your penis is going to shoot across the room and all this other type of stuff. No, it's not that. It's, it's whether you want to call it pressure points of from an Eastern perspective where you're attached, uh, uh, going after, you know, meridian points in the body, or you want to call it from a Western perspective where you're hitting cavities and nerves. It's essentially very similar. And so I started really getting into that and applying that to all my techniques. But it started with me being dumb and say, hey, yeah, you just knocked him out. He's on the floor crumpled up. Do that to me. Years later, I can still, I got to admit, if I could have gone back at that point, I would have smacked myself in the back of the head. All I can imagine is uh, um, Chris Tucker coming out of nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> you, yeah. You, know, you, know, you know the line. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's from yeah. the movie Friday, if, if uh, the mm-hmm. audience is, isn't able to follow along. Yeah. yeah. You got knocked out. <laughs> <laughs> Put a V in front of it. And it's <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. It's good stuff. In fact, yeah. I even tried to do it on a, I had a, I did a, uh, a show for someone. Uh, I, I, I think Disney has it now because Disney was on, yeah, ABC was bought by Disney and uh, directed this piece where they were trying to do some of this stuff. And uh, <laughs> it's hard to get on camera. Because it just it just doesn't look real. No matter how many times I rearrange the cameras, I mm-hmm. it just it doesn't look real. So I had to end up telling them, you know, there's nothing I can do about that. I don't think any director, you know, and and I think I'm a very good director uh, can make this look you know, other than some kind of, you know, hocus pocus, it doesn't look right. You have to see it and experience it. And then, of course, you got all these charlatans that are going around still saying, yeah, if you lift up your big toe and you wink your eye five times, you know, you're not going to feel it, you know, all that kind of crap. But it, um, it's, yeah, it, it's real. It's real. You just don't just take the esoteric garbage out of it, for lack of a better word, and you can put it in actual Western terms, and it works. I've experienced some of it. I, I know. I know what you're talking about. It's not magic, right? And there are people claiming it's magic, and and that's you know puts a. a Puts magic a false light is, on the rest of it, on the reality. Yeah, magic is the science of the ignorant. Because mm-hmm. it ain't magic. It is a science to it. You just don't know it. Mm-hmm. That's what I keep telling people. But then at the same time, I'm like, you know what? You don't believe it. That's fine. That's for me and my students to keep doing. <laughs> Doesn't matter if I think the world's flat. Doesn't change anything. Hey. Keep thinking that the world's flat. And then I'll ask you this question. If the world's flat, we got all these cats. How come they ain't knocked all the fish in the world off it? You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, but hey, that's you know. I like it. You mentioned some time writing and interviewing people. Mm-hmm. How how did how'd you get there? I mean, writing versus versus videography. I mean, it's a completely different medium, but I, I'm I'm guessing somehow the two related. Well, to me, everything was was the media. Because, I mean, even when I was working at Marvel um, in D.C., it, I didn't think of it, oh, this is comic books. I'm thinking, this is me honing my writing skills, and I got to write a script, even though I, can, I still don't know how to write a comic book script. I write a half-hour television teleplay um, 
it, it's all part of the media. And a buddy of mine named uh, Bobby Dreben, Robert Dreben, who is an excellent Kung Fu. He's excellent Kung Fu. He, he's, yeah, he, the first guy, I don't know if this is going to come out right, but um, when I met Bobby, he was the only white guy that I know that in the 80s was asked to come down to Chinatown off of uh, Pell Street. I forgot where the cool was. I think it was off Pell. Or, I don't remember. Anyway, he was asked to come down there to uh, teach Kung Fu. Wow. Yeah, that's Robert Dreamer. Yeah. Bobby's a bad boy. Um, but um, Bobby was already writing for Inside Kung Fu. And um, somehow or another, we got to talking and he suggested that I, you know, put the nod. Oh, in fact, it was the article on Powell. Because I told him I was doing something with Powell. And he said that I should send it in to uh, write it up and send it to uh, Inside Kung Fu. Uh, they didn't take it, but Black Belt took it. Yeah, so that's actually how I got, got into that. But I was already writing because I had written a number of uh, scripts, written a number of teleplays. TJ and I wrote a bunch of teleplays that. I still maintain other people stole. That's why you see certain movies like Lethal Weapon. But uh, <laughs> how'd but, you meet him? Uh, huh? How, how'd you meet him? TJ? Yeah. I was just starting. I just came back from Los Angeles. Uh, we moved back to New York, and I ended up working at the studio on Twenty Third Street. Called at the time it was called ETC Studios on Twenty Third Street and Park Avenue. And um, there was a show there called Comic Book Quiz. Big, big Bob Salan's Comic Book Quiz. It was like a local access show. And this is back in the days when access was, you know, <laughs> access was access. Because we had, I mean, I also worked on a show called The Robin Bird Show. <laughs> and a couple of other shows with, you know, again, people that if I say their names, you might go, oh, I know. But, you know. Wives or girlfriends are around, you're never going to admit that you know them. You know, well, I bet you your left hand knows it. But anyway, um, so we uh, was working on this show, and Bob had this guy that he said was a stuntman who wanted to do uh, a commercial for a comic book store, Backday Magazines. And I'm looking at him like a stuntman, really? All right, if you say so. And, uh, and then in comes TJ. And first thought I had in my head is like, this guy can't move. What kind of stuntman is he? Because I'd never, even out in LA, I'd never seen a stuntman his size. Because TJ is TJ's big. TJ's about 6'7", about a good 260, 270, 280. And I'm thinking, this guy can't. Really? He's going to get hurt. But he did this James Bond type fight scene. And I'm like, dude's pretty good. And then we started talking and uh, we became friends. And then we started, we had what I'd like to think is the first nerd show that took it, took things seriously. We, we came up with a show called Comics Fantasy Forum. And, um, do you remember the old Siskel and Ebert shows? Oh, yeah. And the other shows like on art and things like that that were on PBS? Yep. Well, we took that approach to comic books and fantasy. And basically, you know, now they call it geek culture or nerd culture, whatever. But, you know, in the 80s, it wasn't such a accepted thing. And, uh, God, that made me sound old. <laughs> 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 but uh, anyway, um, we did that. Um, we had, it was aired on PBS for hmm, maybe a year before we had some financial difficulties with the studio. But we had um, we had some pretty interesting guests, like from comic books and movies, and a couple of martial arts stunt people came in, and uh, uh, 
Yeah, that's how I got to, TJ and I just been friends. And then he started training with me. And uh, we did a couple of movies together, did some TV shows, we just kept on from there. Yeah, and, and listeners, if, if you don't know him by by just the initials, this was Teal James Glenn who was on the show. Yeah. <laughs> when the, by the time this comes out, it'll probably be about three months, two and a half to three oh, okay. months. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I keep forgetting. Back to that back then, he wasn't known as Teal. He, we, we just called him TJ. Sure. <laughs> I mean, a guy a guy that big, I would call him whatever he asked me to. <laughs> yeah. Believe it or not, when we went places, which I never could understand, but you can check with him on this. We went someplace, and people would swear I was his bodyguard. <laughs> I'm barely 5'11". Yeah, I'm about 240. But TJ, like I said, he's like six, 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 seven, about two eighty something. You know, look like Errol Flynn, and, and I'm his bodyguard. You guys have been watching Spencer and Hawk a little bit too much. You, you might have had a, a bit of a Leroy Brown vibe yeah, yeah, walking like, around. You know, I don't know. I'm like, okay, but yeah, people swore I was his bodyguard. <laughs> Oh, that was a fun conversation. I enjoyed talking to him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we Did, had some fun. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. Now, you've talked about a lot of things, a lot of work that you've done, you know, scripts and video and and everything. Is any of this stuff available for people to check out? Uh, yeah. Current stuff, if you go to, it's on YouTube. Unless you live in the uh, greater Cincinnati area, then you can catch it on local TV. But otherwise, if you go on YouTube, I learned how to use YouTube, so don't laugh. Um, <laughs> I have a, a channel called From the Dojang and another channel called The Warriors Realm TV. From the Dojang is more like more concerned about uh, overall martial arts things. Like I even did a show about, you know, top. Uh, comic book martial artist um, and things like that. And then from the Warriors realm is interviews with uh, various martial artists. We'll interview them and then they get to show some of their different techniques and perspectives on techniques and how it compares with other things and things like that. Oh, that sounds awesome. So, yeah, those, those two are on. And hopefully... Uh, Things keep going, and maybe in, in 2021, you know, we might be able to have some stuff on Netflix, Hulu. You know, have a couple of uh, uh, half-hour, hour-long dramatic shows with lots of action in it. And some sign me up. I'm always <laughs> always looking for more good martial arts on TV. Yeah, yeah, because it really, in my opinion, it really isn't. It's like it. it there's a lot of stuff. I was watching. Um, I don't want to talk about it, I, but man, buddies of mine I know were working on um, Disney's Iron Fist. Yep. And then <laughs> they wouldn't tell me anything anymore. And I'm like, what's going on? And then I saw it. I'm like, ooh. Ooh, yeah. Yep. Not, not, not good. Why didn't you take the actor and actually have him train in Kung Fu for? A while, so he could actually get into a stance. He, his horse stance looked like he was about to take a poop. Mm. I, I had a theory on Iron Fist, and and you being someone who's been in the industry, I'm 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 curious. So I read a little bit saying that you know they really had to accelerate. Um, I'm trying to remember the actor's name, I don't remember. Finn Jones. Name. Finn Jones. They really had to accelerate his martial arts training and condensed it down into just a few weeks. Uh huh. My guess was they had a timetable for filming so they could get the defenders out because uh -huh. that was the last piece of the four so they could do defenders right and they just they couldn't wait that, that was my guess uh it's a bad excuse bad teachers okay. bad teachers i'm sorry uh, i can tell you tj and, and ross and a bunch of other guys i know i can tell you i've had uh people especially with somebody of finn jones background with his work on Game of Thrones, where he has a physicality, he has a dance background. Nah, he could look better. All you had to do was just take different time. 
showed him the things that you needed to do. Even if you had him walk around in a, in, you know, have him actually work out in a school so he can understand the mentality and the thought processes. I mean, I had, my teacher had a guy in there for three days and it was, he only had him for two hours a day. The guy was a dancer and he was able to move on. So I, I think they just blew the pooch on that. They what just, did you think of Into the Badlands? Did you get to see that? I didn't, that out? Really, couldn't watch it. No, really? I didn't think it was very good. Huh. I thought the choreography was, again, I'm not, this is just my humble opinion, but. Yeah, no, I, I value your opinion. It's, I, I thought the is... choreography was stayed. I thought the choreography looked like bad, you know, 1980s, 1990s, you know, Saturday morning television choreography. I, I could tell. I, I knew what the what the what the actors were going to do before they did it. Mm. It was it was so pre, and they. Mm, I just uh, no. I think I watched. I may have watched the entire first season. And I just said I can't. I can't get into this. It just you, you're you're copying. It's also like, did you see the last John Wick? Yes. What did you think? Violent. I'm not. A, I'm not a big fan of of fight scenes that take the violence to that to that place. That's just not you know. Just emotionally, I don't. I don't dig that. I, I prefer. Mm-hmm. You know, like my my favorite martial arts film of all time is Crouching Tiger. So that gives you an idea of what Ooh. you know. What I really okay. enjoy. Okay. Well, the last John Wick I thought was not good because I thought a lot of the choreography, especially Halle Berry's choreography, in that long overdrawn fight scene was completely redundant. She did the same thing mm. like 24 times. And I'm like, okay, they're going to shoot. She's going to shoot behind her. She's going to roll. Now she's going to climb up on the guy and get him in that lock. And then, okay, now she's going to roll over, shoot, get the guy's legs, roll over on him and do that again. Now she, it's like, come on. You're doing the same thing. Were you under time constraints where you couldn't? do something else and why did that have to go on that long you don't have enough storyline it just it just i I just i was really disappointed in the last one i liked the first one i thought the first one was interesting i'm like this is this is okay the second one was all right but that third one i'm like man who who choreographed that what happened why what what happened (laughs) Did you see uh, Warrior on, was that Cinemax, Showtime? Uh, the, the Bruce Lee-inspired show that came from Shannon Lee? No, I didn't really. I think I, you should I, check that out. Yeah, I saw one part of it, and I'm thinking, and I know this is going to offend a bunch of people. I looked at part of, I saw, you know how, uh, when we back when we had cable, because we cut the cable, it was like too yeah. stupid. But um, you can see the same thing streaming for a lot less money. Um, <laughs> That's right. Um, you know how they used to have the free weekends mm-hmm. so I had the show time and I saw and all I could see that one episode maybe it was a bad episode I enjoyed it because I like watching naked women walk around I can't have one in my living room but <laughs> I'm sitting there watching and going oh is this oh, she naked oh this young lady's naked too oh here's another naked woman okay this is this is fun this is from Bruce Lee this is from Shannon Lee. Okay, I wonder. Mm. Okay, okay, a lot of naked people going on. Oh, there's a fight. Oh, oh no, there's more naked women. Okay, <laughs> you know, it felt like I was watching Spartacus or something like that. Yeah, yeah. The the fight scenes, the choreography, especially the deeper you got into the show, it got, re- in my opinion, it got really good. It was really creative. We had okay, what one, two of the guests, uh, one, two of the the actors came on as guests and, and we had some, had some fun talking to them, but you could tell that the choreography was an important piece of the show, as opposed to a lot of shows and movies where it's, it's an afterthought. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was curious. I did want to see more of it, but I don't mean that in a Puritan way, because, but um, I, I just didn't have show time. And a friend of mine was comparing it to, I don't know if you ever saw the Netflix Marco Polo. Yeah. Yeah. I watched a bit of that. 
Was yeah, good? now first six episodes of Marco Polo were absolutely horrible. But then again, traditionally, when you're working on a TV show, a TV series, the first five are not that good. Crew doesn't usually, cast and crew don't usually gel mm. until episode six. So sometimes they'll put episode six on as the first episode if they can do that. Um, but uh, the first five or six of the of, of Marco Polo, I'm like, all this is is again naked women walking around, which is kind of nice to see. I'm like, and I don't, I'm not watching porn, so I'm not gonna get in trouble with anybody. But uh, and then, like, all of a sudden, episode six, they had a plot and they had a story, and I'm like, okay. And then I forgot the the British actor's name. Um, I think he played Hundred Eyes or whatever his name is. They unleashed him, and I'm like, ho ho! Now this is some interesting choreography. <laughs> <laughs> this this is a little different. <laughs> He's doing things that I'm not, you, you know, you don't usually see. But it was a little different. I'm like, okay. And I really liked what they did with 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 a lot of the fight choreography and trying to just do something different. Um, there's a Korean film called The Man from Nowhere, where not only is the storyline good, the fights and the, even the the gunplay is a little different. It's like okay, it, it's 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 interesting. I I hold to that whole thing. If you're going to do a martial art film, you should first have a good story. Yeah. Once you have a good story and you figure out a good way to make it exciting, have the martial arts in it, whether it's just a martial artist or not. In other words, like like some of uh, Jackie Chan's movies, because Jackie Chan really doesn't do, especially since after a uh, police story, he doesn't do a lot of traditional martial arts. It's more, you know, Chan Fu, if you want to call it anything. Um, but it keeps your interest. Yes. Um, but you need to have a good story and then don't skimp on the fights. Each fight should tell a story. Within the fight, there has to be story. There has to be beats. There has to be a rhythm. It's not just kick, kick, punch, punch, throw. Okay, next guy. Kick, kick, punch, punch, throw. Next guy. There has to be beats, rhythm. Um, even though we might think of it, you know, in another way, if you watch pro wrestling, yeah, the 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 bad guy is fighting the good guy. The good guy is winning. Then all of a sudden, the bad guy is winning. Now the bad guy looks like he's going to take over and and beat the good guy. Something happens. Now the good guy wins. That should happen in a fight. Each fight that you tell should be a story, a small story. You know, there should be beats in there, rhythms. And even if I think one of the Bruce Lee's best movies was uh, a Fist of Fury, or actually it was called The Chinese Connection. Because I, well, one reason why I absolutely think it was great because Bruce wasn't a Superman. He could get hit. But there are beats and rhythms in that where it looks like, oh, wait, is this guy going to hurt Bruce? You know what I mean? And that has to um, Jackie tells that beautifully. Mm -hmm. He does that beautifully. And if you're going to have a fight, unless you're saying that, yes, this is Superman or this is Hercules, and Hercules is going to, like those old uh, Steve Reeves movies, Hercules is going to come and, and knock everybody over. So you're not really focused on Hercules, you're focused on everybody else. All right. But yeah. otherwise, let me see a good story within that fight. Keep my interest. And unfortunately, a lot of these movies and TV shows don't do that. They just say, you look like you're watching a bad, not a bad, but an interesting school, a, 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 a particular school's interesting demonstration or exhibition. And that's not what you should see on a movie or TV screen. What's your favorite fight scene? Do you have one? Uh, I have a few. Yeah, let, let's. let's uh, <laughs> I love the 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 fight scenes in the Princess Bride. Not um, the first time we've heard that mentioned on this show, actually. 
Eh. Um, again, Bruce Lee in uh, the uh, Chinese Connection. Um, I love watching Hong Zhang Lee. He might not be a household name, but back in the day, when you go down to Chinatown on 42nd Street to watch, you know, some of the movies, if we saw his face in, you know, on, on the lobby cards, we'd go in. We'd fall asleep to the movie. Then his fight scene would come up. It's like, yeah, back then, we'd go in a movie, see three movies for like 75 cents. Mm. And um, it's the 70s. And um, his fight scenes were always interesting he did in fact we even went out and bought his <laughs> like a bunch of idiots we went out and bought his tape um the the high impact kicking and um tried to do that and ended up hurting ourselves <laughs> but uh but um uh, his his fight scenes he just he just brought a quality of acting to it that was 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 what the fight scene should be. Mm. He even had a way of making people who weren't good fighters, you know, look good, you know, even though they were nowhere near his quality. Um, so I had a couple. I just can't think of, a, like I said, outside of Chinese Connection. Um, oh, oh, Donnie Yen and Sammo Hung, that final fight scene in, uh, I think it's Shopang Lo, Shopang Long. I don't know that one. Um, uh, I forgot. I forgot the American name of it. But Donnie Yen is a cop. And kill Samuel, zone. Say again. Kill zone. I think that's what it might be called. I'm doing, I'm doing a quick IMDb search. Yeah, that's what it might be called in America. Kill zone. Samo is a gangster, and Donnie is a cop trying to bring him to justice. Um, yeah, I think it was called Kill Zone. Yeah, that, oh my God. And here you got two choreographers. Samuel's choreography is, Samuel's choreography of Jackie Chan is excellent. Yes. But, but, yes. but Samuel, Samuel and, Hung is the most underrated martial arts actor of all time, in my opinion. Yes. And Samuel Hung is, like I told people, he's a patron saint of us bigger guys. <laughs> mm. <laughs> but yeah. That that fight scene, and again, everything that I'm talking about, the rhythms, the beats, the story that it's telling within each fight sequence. Donnie's winning. Samuel's winning. Donnie's doing something else. Now Samuel cheats. Or does he cheat? But what's happening? You know, it's there's a story within the fight, and it keeps you going because you have no idea who's going to win. Yeah, that was good. Some of the Ipman fights when all oh, the in Ipman was it three? Uh the fight scene that Donnie Yen has in the elevator. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that was good. And for long form, long form, I I I like the raid. Yep. Uh, I I like those hallway scenes in the raid. I even enjoy that scene in Daredevil. I thought that was good, though. Unfortunately, you know, we knew, you know, what was happening. Like, you could tell where, where which was the actor and which was the stunt man. <laughs> <laughs> but, but when I said that, you know, a lot of people can't. You know, but like you said, myself, TJ, Ross, you know, we were stunt people. We're looking at it. Like, oh, there's a the stunt guy. Oh, there, there's the actor. <laughs> but that was a, that was a good scene. That, those, 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 but yeah, I gotta say that Samo and Donnie Yen, that 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 was that that excellent fight. In fact, when um, a buddy of mine was asking me to do a, a seminar on uh, fight choreography for martial artists, I, I played that. Mm. I played that scene. I shouldn't know because they were everybody trying to you know outdo each other. I'm like, no, these guys were subduing. They didn't, uh, they didn't get it, but you know. Sometimes less is more. Sometimes less is more. Yes. This has been a phenomenal conversation. And as 
I had hoped we went places I didn't expect. I mean, that for me, that's <laughs> always the fun is, is, you know, where is this going to go? And you told some utterly wonderful stories. Oh, thank and you. <laughs> we, we end in, in the same, but different way each time. And, and that is that I asked the guest to decide how we go out. What, what final words, what wisdom advice, you know, whatever you want to call it, what would you want to leave people with today as we finish up your episode of martial arts radio? Well, if you send, you know, twelve ninety nine to no. Uh, <laughs> honestly, I think whatever it is that you do, especially if you're talking about martial arts. If you do martial arts, understand the art and understand what you're doing. Understand the principles. Understand the principles of what you're doing. It's not just the flashy kicks. It's not just the those wonderful punches and throws. What are you actually doing and why are you doing it? Get into the principles and the fundamentals of what you're doing. And you can translate that if you want to move on to something different, if you want to get into television, if you want to get into movies. You know, uh, a great way to do that is to be a stunt person. Well, keep in mind, if you're going to be a stunt person, you are not the star. You know, take the kick, take the punch. Your job is to make the star look good. And do your due diligence with anything else. Understand the fundamental principles. The fundamental principles of being in television and film is being dependable and reliable. Not so much, oh, this person's a great talent, but be dependable and reliable. Fundamental principles of doing your particular martial art, you know, what, what's your body position? You know, what's your kinesiology? How are you going to execute these techniques? Well, same thing in transitioning into something else. Martial arts is something that can put its fingers into almost any industry or anything you want to do. If you understand the fundamental principles, you'll do good or you'll do well. If there's any English teachers out there. That's about it. Now, hopefully everyone sees what I mean when I said that this was a funny conversation. I laughed more in this episode than I have in a long time. So, sir, thank you for that. Thank you for the gift of that laughter. Thank you for the gift of your time, your conversation. Had a blast. Hope we get to connect in person sometime soon. If you want to see the show notes with photos and a whole lot more, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Every episode has its own page with even a transcript. Maybe not the day it comes out, but pretty soon thereafter. And if you're willing to support us in all the work that we're doing, you have lots of options. Make a purchase at whistlekick.com. Use the code podcast15 to get 15% off. You could also share an episode, leave a review, tell a friend, or contribute to the Patreon. Patreon.com slash whistlekick. And I hope if you see somebody out there wearing something with whistlekick on it, you'll introduce yourself. Who knows what'll happen? And of course, I'd love to hear your guest suggestions. Email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. And don't forget to follow us. We're on social media at whistlekick. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.